All right, Nick Mac Paddywax, let's get it on multiple genes. I can't even get it. Why do I do this? Okay, so we're going to talk about these are on different chromosomes, multiple genes on different chromosomes. So they're just starting independently. Uh, and then we're going to have gene interactions, and I can't stop laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, two genes on different chromosomes. I'm Go get some water. So now that I've had a week to stop laughing at how dumb I sound, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these. Um, if you have genes that are on separate, completely separate, independently assorting chromosomes, and how they would uh, segregate out if you're doing a cross and looking at two traits. Okay. So we've got two traits. Uh, the genes for each of those traits are on separate chromosomes, so they're going to behave completely independently. All right, there is an equal probability of you winding up with one if any of the trait combinations here. Okay, so we've got our yellow peas, uh, and if their yellow is dominant and green is recessive, and then we have our um, let me grab my little pointer here if you're not helping at all, but you can stay. So here are our yellow peas, okay, that are also smooth. All right, and smooth is a dominant trait, and then we have our P that is recessive for both traits. It's recessive for color, so it's going to be green, and it's also recessive for smoothness, so its trait is phenotype is now wrinkled. Okay, so we have our in our parent generation our yellow round and our um, green wrinkled peas that we're going to cross, and we're, they're only going to have one particular set of gametes that is possible from each, okay, for these guys. The only gametes it can give are the two um, dominant alleles, and here the only gametes it can give are the recessive alleles. So your F1 is going to be all heterozygous, okay, and therefore they're going to be all yellow and round, okay, but they are carriers of the uh, recessive uh, allele there. Now if we cross those together, we do a self-fertilization Okay, now we're going to see this interesting segregation. Now you've got potential, lots of different potential gamete combinations, okay? Either both of the two dominant alleles, one of each of the dominant alleles, or both of the recessive alleles, okay? And so this is, uh, hopefully, I know you've done this in GenBio. Uh, if this looks entirely confusing and horrific to you, please come to office hours and let me know. I'll be more than happy to talk you through it. But we're going to wind up with this um, sort of block of possibilities here in the traditional Punnett square. If we look at our, we got a bunch of different genotypes, okay, right now we're going to mainly look at the phenotype ratio, but we're going to see um, that we get, if we look at just one of the traits, if we look at just yellow to green, we're going to get a three to one phenotypic uh, ratio, just, just as though it was a single gene trait. If we look at overall the ratio of the round and wrinkled, we're going to see the same thing. It's segregated out just like it was a um, its own um, single trait, and then we just have the combination of the two that gives us this the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So the 9 is the um, yellow smooth. Overwhelmingly, we get more yellow smooth. Okay? Uh, and then we get three that are yellow but wrinkled here. We get three that are green but they're round here. And then we get one of the both recessive traits are showing up in the offspring. Okay, but if you look at each gene separately, each gene is still behaving according to that um, sort of simple uh, Mendelian dominance ratio. So uh, we could do this also with a fork line diagram. Okay, so if you look at this two traits here, what you would actually do is build a little um, teeny Punnett square. Okay, so what's Y doing? So here's my, you know, I've got a big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, and you would do that out and be like, oh, okay, it's going to be a three quarter yellow to a one quarter green. All right, cool. So that's going to go there. And then you could do another Punnett square to see what's going to happen to in gene two. And same thing here, you've got your, it's, uh, I'm doing this with mouse. It's great. Oh, okay. So that's also going to be a three quarter to one quarter, and I'm going to stick that in the second column there, and then I'm going to use my product rule and multiply across. So uh, three quarter yellow times three quarter round. Three times three is nine. Four times four is sixteen. All right. That's my ratio for that particular phenotype, and you do that down through 
to get your uh, same thing here, we're going to wind up with the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Okay, all out of 16. Okay, so you're going to see the same thing where we get this breakup of it's still a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio for each trait. Okay, and then we multiply the probabilities using our product rule that gives us the total phenotypic ratio. The way to check yourself so you don't wreck yourself is to go through and add up this column here, does 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 equal 16? Yes, it does. Okay, then we're good to go. Okay, so here is where we're getting that, like why, why is it equally likely to get a, you know, a YR um, or a little y, little r from one of the parents in the, this is in the, um, the F1 times F1 here. <laughs> well, but I've done such good drawing, I'm going to leave him a sneeze. All right. <clears throat> so what's happening is that there are two possibilities for how the tetrads line up, okay, in the uh, cell that's undergoing meiosis here. Either the, the, the parental chromosomes are kind of staying together, or it's equally likely that the parental chromosomes kind of switch and line up as so. Cell doesn't really um, care at that point. Okay, so then after the tetrads separate, it's equally likely that you're going to get um, either the maternal staying together, the paternal staying together, or there being a switch. And that's how you get that sort of equal uh, probability of these different gametes popping out because we're looking at just one organism. Okay, This is going to be really cool when we get to population genetics because then we're not just looking at what's happening in one organism but across a population and it's going to come back to this as well. Uh, what is the probability that a certain type of gamete is going to be more or less um, seen in, a, in the population. Okay, So um, here we go. The chromosomes are blue and pink depending on if they're maternal or paternal but they could segregate independently okay and so that's what gets us this equal probability of the different um, allele combinations because these alleles are on separate chromosomes all right so that is the the whole separate chromosomes eventually we're going to you know, over to linked genes that'll actually be the next chapter but in this chapter we're going to uh, focus on um, either phenotypic different ones that are uh, rising from a single gene, and they're also going to talk about when genes start interacting with each other um, and start changing. And these are unlinked genes again. They're, they're not on the same chromosome and how that starts uh, messing with different uh, phenotypes. Okay. So the first of the single gene unexpected phenotype things we're going to look at is incomplete dominance. This is what appears to be blending. You have a true breeding white flower and a true breeding red flower, and when you breed them together, you get pink. Clearly, the colors just blended. All right. And then when you uh, breed the F1 with itself, a couple pink flowers, then it starts getting weird. You see red flowers pop out, and you see white flowers pop out again. Um, so what's going on here at a genetic level, okay, uh, we have our heterozygote that what we call this is a, um, this is the intermediate phenotype, okay, it is intermediate between mom and dad, something strange is going on there, okay, uh, and so let's look at a different example, it's called hypercholesteromia, okay, and so you have this gene for a low density lipid receptor on the outside of your cells, <clears throat> there's a couple other genes as well as that affect this, but cool my drawing stays. All right, what happens is if you have two copies of the gene that code for these L low density lipid receptors, you make a bunch of them on your the outside of your cell and then the the uh, cholesterol binds to that and isn't free flowing in your blood. If you are heterozygous for this, you have about half the receptors that you would have. There's only one copy of that gene, whereas there is normally two. So it's producing about half the amount of receptors. And so you have slightly more elevated um, low density lipids in your blood, which can become a problem. If you are homozygous recessive for this gene and you don't have any copies of it, then you are not producing any receptors at all and you actually end up having, this is the hypercholesterol cholesterolemia, that um, you have a kind of a dangerous amount of cholesterol always in your blood at all times just because you're not producing receptors. So what it means is that in this case you needed two copies of this gene to achieve like a full phenotype and with only one 
uh, your body isn't compensating or um, increasing transcription of that gene from the single copy. So you have a phenotype that is um, intermediate. And then if you don't have a copy at all, you're not producing, you don't have an enzyme, you don't have a receptor, you're not producing something within that um, uh, biochemical pathway. Okay, so this is another example of incomplete dominance. In the flower, it's much the same way. There's an enzyme that's breaking down some um, uh, compound to form a red pigment. Uh, and then in the intermediate phenotype, there's less, uh, there's only one copy of the genes, so there's less of that enzyme being actually made, or it's not being transcribed and then translated, so it's not expressing as well, and you're getting a, what looks to be a blend, but is actually just sort of a, like a, a half, a half's worth made of that particular enzyme or compound. Now, intermediate dominance gets a little tricky because it depends on what assay you're using to look at the phenotype to determine what is going on. So uh, in the flower case, we're looking at straight up like how much pigment there is in the flower. Okay, But say we're looking at something like um, bacterial growth. Okay, uh, If we just have um, an enzyme that as long as there's some of it, the bacteria grow well. Say the if you're heterozygote and you don't have like a super growth penalty as long as some enzyme is present you're doing okay then just by looking at growth you would see this pattern and you would say oh well um, this must be a dominant trait because both the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous are growing well on say this minimal media and this uh, this hetero uh, homozygous recessive is not growing well so clearly it's a dominant trait but then if we're looking at how much enzyme there is in the um, sample, so we go and look at it there, and then we start saying, oh, there's a hundred unit of enzyme activity here, but we see only like 50 to 65 in the heterozygote. Oh, okay, and then there's none in the homozygote recessive, then, okay, this must actually be an intermediate dominant trait. We just couldn't pick it up in the growth assay. We had to actually look at enzyme activity, how much enzyme is being produced and active. And then if we go even further to the DNA sequence, which is kind of an odd phenotype, but technically phenotype uh, could be considered one, um, it's just an allele. And this one is, um, uh, this particular allele uh, shows up um, next to the, the uh, recessive allele here. Um, you could kind of consider all alleles co-dominant at the level of the DNA. I think it's a little whack. Uh, generally, that's our genotype, um, but sure, we could take a look at that. So I guess the point that this figure is trying to make is that you have to be careful what um, what you're looking at when you want to determine something as a um, co-dominant, intermediate dominant, or um, sort of simple Mendelian inheritance trait is that the uh, assay that you're using skew your perception of what's actually going on. In this case, we would want to look at enzyme activity. Enzyme activity, the fact that there is a reduction here uh, says to us that that's pretty clearly a, actually is, hold on, let me get my little marker, a intermediate dominant trait. Okay, uh, This doesn't clutch it for us and DNA sequence does not clutch it for us. Uh, how much of the gene is actually being expressed in terms of enzyme activity is what we want to base our um, categorization on. All right, so that wraps up intermediate dominance. The next system we're going to look at is the human blood type, the ABO system. Rhesus factor, which is the positive negative, is a separate gene. So we're just looking at the ABO uh, blood type here. And what this does is that we have our red blood cell over here, there's a red blood cell, and it's got a lot of um, these little tags on it, sort of um, glycoproteins, okay? So part of the glycoprotein, the protein part, is embedded into the um, surface of the cell, and then it has this sort of chain of um, carbohydrates, different carbohydrates, and, and um, this gluconac and acetylglucosamine here popping off the end, uh, where it's just a, sort of a recognition tag. Okay, so your body can say, yes, that is my red blood cell. Good, good, it's there. Okay, so sort of the um, recessive form of this, the one um, is is just called the, it's a it's little I here. Okay, and so if you have type O blood, you basically have just this phenotype right here. You don't have any extra knickknacks hanging off your um, blood glycoprotein sugar tags. 
um, it's the um, sort of the, the basic uh, here you had don't have a um, active anything else nothing is being added to your um, chains okay so this is the just called the H antigen here if you are type A okay your type A blood then you have an enzyme that actually adds a little galnac this an acetyl galactosamine galnac to your H antigen okay if you are type B you have an enzyme that adds a little extra galactose onto your um, H antigen here. Okay, you don't need to know the and this this chain of sugars. You don't need to know this additional thing here, but I do want you to know that the um, that there's um, in in if you're a type A blood, then you are adding an extra piece to your uh, H antigen chain. If you were at type B blood, you're adding a different piece to your H antigen. And hold on, I'll be right back. All right, so uh, this ABO locus here gives us what we would consider co-dominant traits, okay? If you have uh, type A blood, there are two potential genotypes. You could either have two copies that give you that A antigen there, or as even if you just have one copy of the A antigen allele, that's gonna override the um, other one pretty much completely and your blood cells are going to have um, A antigens. Just the presence of that means that you are going to make anti B antigen antibodies. Okay, your body is on alert if they see anything that looks like not type A. Okay, same for type B here. Um, you're going to be your all of your little red blood cells are going to have the B antigen on it and therefore if your body ever sees anything with an A antigen it's going to go haywire okay if you are type O you are not producing any of those antigens your body is on the lookout for anything that is different okay but your blood cells themselves are not producing any particular antigens this is why type o is known as the universal donor because it's not going to since there are no antigens on the outside of the red blood cell um, anybody can have can can receive type o blood and not have a terrible reaction Okay. If you are type AB, where you're produce, producing both the A antigen and the B antigen, uh, that's great if you need to get a blood donation because you can accept blood from any of the above, okay, because your body is not going to react to those as a potential threat. Okay, So we would consider that these two, both the A allele okay, and the B allele, are codominant. Okay, they can just both express. If you have a copy of each, they're going to both express equally, and um, then these are this type is appearing twice. Okay, uh, and then here's type O, which is not producing any particular antigens, but um, is uh, you cannot receive blood from anybody who has any of those antigens. Okay, so that is our kind of classic codominance example where um, both traits are expressing in the individual yeah there they are so you've got the if you're a b blood type they're co-dominant both of them are expressing and um, yeah, your body is not actually going to have a problem with any particular other type of blood okay so another example is agouti coloration so this is um basically the pattern of banding on a uh, hair so something in this, you see a goody coloration in like mice and rats and dogs and rabbits and um, any sort of animal that has like a hair with a stripe or a band on it. Okay, so this agouti locus produces molecule that regulates where um, eumelanin is produced. So the kind of black pigment, and then we have, um, so black pigment is known as eumelanin, and then we have pheomelanin, which is uh, kind of an orange, uh, uh, different uh, sort of pigment that is a lighter color and so this agouti gene regulates um, where the banding pattern is and also it also regulates whether or not its um, color is being deposited on the dorsal hair on the back of the animal or the ventral hair on the belly okay. so there's sort of a series in terms of dominance here 
where um, this Y allele, uh, and this is interesting, actually blocks the uh, agouti Y allele, blocks uh, any melanin, U melanin production altogether. So that's going to be dominant to the other alleles. And then um, full coloration is actually the um, most recessive. If there's any sort of blockage of melanin production, it is dominant over the others. Okay, So we get the series of uh, full blockage is most dominant. Okay, We have um, sort of a one stripe dominance, uh, one stripe on the dorsal hairs. Then we have this sort of split coloration where you only get uh, deposition on the on the dorsal hairs and none on the ventral hairs. And then finally you have your um, full coloration there. Okay, So um, this one just lacks any sort of dis melanin, eumelanin distribution, so it gives you a completely colored coat and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and then we have our um, examples so like a pug doesn't have any of those the agouti coloration. Elk hound has that lighter on light on the bottom and darker on top, but the top has the uh, agouti striping to give that sort of um, shaded coloration. A Gordon setter has light on the bottom, dark on top, and then a pulley has um, complete color coverage there. Uh, very kind of similar similar to color point in cats, but in cats it's backwards where the um, pigment deposition is uh, the dominant trait, and then loss of pigment deposition is um, recessive. So this is kind of an interesting example. Okay. The next thing we have is a single gene weirdness is lethal alleles. Okay, so some lethal alleles are recessive, and so when you get the two, uh, the homozygous dominant would survive. You could have a heterozygote because you have one copy of that wild type allele there, you're okay. This one as well, even though you have um, the lethal recessive, uh, you're fine. But then if you get two copies of the lethal recessive, um, it uh, it dies. You know, basically doesn't even go through um, gestation or whatever, and you get this interesting uh, one to two ratio, okay, in, in your phenotypes, if there is a different phenotype in the heterozygous because these guys just didn't even make it to um, um, make it, sur they didn't even survive. Okay, So you will see this interesting. If you start seeing thirds, like one third this way, two thirds that way, that's letting you know if you see a third that something happened to that quarter and that just disappeared off the face of the earth and you're dealing with a lethal uh, allele. Let's see if I can find a good example of that. So here's an interesting example where a dominant allele ends up being um, uh, lethal, okay? In that we, the curly phenotype can only be expressed in homozygous individuals, okay? Uh, because if you get two copies of the curly wing gene, you die. Uh, and then here, if you, so you can only ever breed um, heterozygous curly flies, right? And they will occasionally produce wild type offspring. But if we were to do a phenotypic ratio, of this uh, cross, we would have um, two curly flies to one wild type fly. Apologies. Uh, let me see if I can. There we go. Wild type. Right. And so when we look at that, we say, wait, that's that's out of three. That's two thirds to one third. There you go. That's your uh, key that it's a lethal allele going on here. 